Good evening. This has been a wonderful week at Concordia St. Paul with folks coming to us and sharing important and significant messages and content. So what a joy this evening to have yet one more highlight of the academic year. Welcome to the 11th lecture in the Vern Gunderman Reformation History Series. The Reformation lecture is unique and specific to Concordia St. Paul, and it has an important history, and Dr. Cushman has invited me to share a few words about its history. Uh, then we'll pray and I will introduce him. Um, we have an outstanding speaker tonight, and I think you're really, really going to enjoy David Zoll. But first a bit about the history of the Reformation lecture. The lecture was established in 2010. 12, as we began to look forward to the 500th anniversary of the Reformation and Martin Luther advertising his 95 theses in Wittenberg, Germany for discussion among the church. As it grew closer, uh, we accelerated our pace and held the first lecture uh, right at 2012. In the years that followed 2017, we said, this is a really good idea. Let's keep it going. So that idea germinated and uh, efforts were made to name the lecture in the honor of, the, in, in the honor of uh, Vernon Dale Gunderman. Most of us knew him as Vern Gunderman, uh, father of our campus pastor, Tom Gunderman, and now grandfather of two of our students. Uh, Vern was a much beloved pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. A large portion of his ministry was spent here in the metro area and had many, many friends throughout the church. So the idea was that we will keep this going and invite friends of Vern to support the lecture on an ongoing basis. So this lecture marks the fifth year that the funds from the Friends of Vern have been used to support the Reformation Lecture Series. It is a signature event of the Department of Theology and Ministry, and it's one of those that events that continues to come to us through the generous blessing of donors. Today, if you didn't know it, is Give to the Max Day in Minnesota. Uh, so if any of you have not yet participated in Give to the Max Day and want yet to do so and would like to support this lecture series, uh, please consider doing so at CSP's website, one.csp.edu. That was a commercial. Tonight, though, the purpose really is to continue to celebrate the threefold truths of the Reformation. Faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone. As we do so, we give thanks and praise to God for the gift of his Holy Spirit that continues to renew and enlighten the church that works in our hearts and lives to help us better understand the depth of Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior of the world. And as we do so, we lift up saints like Pastor Vern Gunderman, who walked before us to proclaim and practice the good news of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So as we gather tonight, we pray, and then, David, we look forward to hearing you after a wonderful and warm introduction by your good friend and colleague, the Reverend Dr. Mark Cushman, we pray. Blessed Lord Jesus, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embra embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please now welcome with me the Reverend Dr. Mark Cushman, the Associate Provost of Faith and Ministry at Concordia St. Paul and Chair of our Department of Theology and Ministry. Dr. Cushman.
Well, tonight we're very pleased to welcome David Zoll, but we have lots of other guests too that I'd just like to recognize tonight because it's a, a fun gathering for all of us here on this snowy Minnesota day. Oh, I hope you get a sense of is the, the sense of Christian community and intellect that is fostering here in the Twin Cities, um, which happens with our students first and foremost, and I'll share a little bit about them, and then also with a partnership that we have with the Ansem House um, at the University of Minnesota, and I've invited, or will invite in a moment, Brian Bademan to share just a quick word about the work of the Ansem House. Increasingly, we find ways to work together and to collaborate on ways of connecting Christian faith with all the different aspects of our life. So one of the cool, uh, aspects of Concordia St. Paul is we have our Solus Christus Fellows program. And if you're in the Solus Christus Fellows program, could you just stand briefly and wave to everybody here this evening? All right, awesome. These students meet every Monday night at Yellowbird Coffee, and we read, among many different things, um, the Mockingbird Journal. Um, David Zoll is the editor-in-chief of Mockingbird Ministries and the founding director of that organization. And as you'll hear tonight, you'll get a real deep sense of God's grace as it works in um, everyday life in kind of down-to-earth ways. And so we read those articles, we discuss it, um, and it's been kind of fun over the years to see this community really uh, grow, including having one of our students, um, Kelly Yi, um, who has been in class with me and with others um, here on our campus and has graduated, got an internship with Mockingbird Ministries, um, and now is, has a full job at Mockingbird Ministries as well. So we're excited, Kelly, to welcome you back to campus. Um, and so again, again, just this neat way in which God is at work in our lives and is calling us to lives of service and of thought and inquiry and just this whole uh, conversation that we have uh, together. The other organization, um, it's not the other organization, the other main student group that I wanted to recognize tonight is the um, Christian Thought and Leadership um, Living and Learning Community. So if those students would be willing to stand up really quick too. Um, if you're in the Living Learning Community, Good to see all of you. These are first year students who have, um, who live in, I think, one of our nicer dorms, Hyatt, um, and work with Drew Dees and a few others um, and are in Dr. Lessing's Old Testament course uh, together, but to really kind of have a really immersive first year experience. Um, so with that, I wanted to invite um, Brian Bademan, Dr. Brian Bademan, um, for to share a quick word about the Ansem House. There are a few, I know uh, Andrew Hansen, um, my counterpart over at the, the Ansem House, who directs a similar um, fellows program um, at the University of Minnesota, um, is here, and perhaps there's a few others of you from the Ansem House. Um, we typically go to the University of Minnesota um, to hear uh, lectures and presentations, um, but it's really exciting to have you guys here today with us. So. Uh, let me uh, say it's a delight and honor uh, to partner with Concordia St. Paul and uh, all these uh, programs that are represented here uh, at Concordia. Uh, Mark has become a good friend of ours at Anselm House and uh, President Friedrich as well. Um, and so we're just very grateful uh, to be working with you in the Twin Cities in this sort of ecosystem and doing similar kinds of things in, in different contexts. Um, we sometimes, at Anselm House, we sometimes think of ourselves as a, a very small Christian college uh, working uh, at a large public and pluralistic university, bringing the theological and intellectual resources of the Christian faith to undergraduates, to graduate students, and even to faculty at the university, so that's, that's our work. And so in, that, in, in the sense that we're working at all these levels and across all kinds of disciplines, we're sort of collegiate in uh, our essence, even though we're a good bit smaller than a place like Concordia St. Paul. But we're, but we're working on some similar problems and some similar issues, and so it's so great for us to have you as a partner here in town. Um, if you are hearing about Anselm House for the first time tonight and would like to know more about this uh, little outpost 
uh, on the University of Minnesota campus. Uh, Andrew Hansen, our program director, or I would love uh, to talk with you, tell you more about it. Of course, you can look at anselmhouse.org. Uh, but we'd love to uh, just tell you a little bit. Of, maybe you're thinking about the University for Graduate School and wonder what it would be like uh, to plug in as a graduate student to, to Anselm House. Uh, those are the kinds of questions that we would love to talk to you about. So again, thank you all. Thanks, uh, Mark and, and everyone. Well, and so now on to our main event. David Zoll is the director of Mockingbird Ministries, as I said. He graduated from Georgetown University in 2001 and then worked for several years as a youth minister in New England. In 2007, he founded Mockingbird in New York City. Today, David and his wife, Kate, reside in Charlottesville, Virginia, with their three boys, where David also serves on the staff of Christ Episcopal Church. He's the author of many books. Some of my favorites are, and one that our students read, Law and Gospel, A Theology for Sinners and Saints, um, a really accessible and brilliant piece of work that articulates in a very compelling way uh, a very Lutheran idea of distinguishing law and gospel. And then also some of the magazines, the Mockingbird Journalist one that we're reading right now, um, and then one that Kelly has an article in, The Sleep Issue. Um, and it's kind of fun for them to explore what theology looks like on a topic of sleep, for example. Um, so David has worked on those projects, but he's also well known for his work on his book um, published with Fortress Press, Seculosity, How Career, Parenting, Technology, Food, Politics, and Romance Became Our New Religion and What to Do About It. And then in the most recent uh, work, which is what he'll be speaking on tonight, is his book, Low Anthropology, and his topic is A Gateway to Grace in a World of Burnout. Please welcome David Zoll. Well, thank you. Sometimes you don't recognize the person they introduce, you know? Um, so I hope, whoa, whoa, sorry, I shouldn't have touched that. Um, thank you for having me. This is a real joy and an honor, especially since I've gotten to know Callie and I've, uh, just uh, she's been so em embraced in a deep and important part of our community, not only at Mockingbird, but in Charlottesville at, uh, uh, at Christ Church where I work. And so to hear, to be at the place that she loves so much and to watch her come alive, talking about it, it's just, I would just say it's a, it's a tribute to the, to the university, uh, her wonderful um, love of this place. So I've yearned to be here. Um, thank you, Mark, as well, for welcoming me. And thank you for, when we first heard that there was a group of students in Minnesota reading our magazine over coffee at night, we just... Uh, you know, didn't really know what to do with that information. It was, uh, it, was uh, uh, it, it was deeply validating and also a little concerning. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we haven't lost too many of them yet. So I am here to talk about low anthropology, and I realize this is a Reformation lecture. I want to say up front that everything I'm about to say is deeply rooted in the Reformation. You may not hear the words that you want to, that 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 you rec that uh, that you immediately connect with the Reformation, but that's because I'm trying to translate them. And when you translate stuff, sometimes you get a little imprecise. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Maybe this is all a terrible idea. <laughs> Maybe you've come out on a night to watch some guy play fast and loose. But I don't. I like to think that we've got some kind of purchase on the meaning of the Reformation as it relates to uh, people today. Uh, this book, as, as my previous book, is really, um, if there's an operating, a larger purpose to the project of this, this, this writing, it's really to make the beautiful truths at the heart of the Protestant Reformation intelligible to contemporary people. And by intelligible, I don't just mean intellectually intelligible, I mean emotionally intelligible. And that's um, because that's where I feel they operate on a very, very deep level. 
So I say that just by way of warning you that Martin Luther doesn't get mentioned once in this talk. He gets almost the final word in the book, so I kind of got that, right? I mean, I, like, you can give me that. Uh, the, the understand why I'm here. I will talk about Philip Melanchthon really briefly, okay? So for those of you keeping score at home, I love the Reformation. I care about the Reformation. And I support all the solas that we've just heard. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you about regret. Hopefully you haven't, you're not regretting this already. If you are, buckle your seatbelt, because there's a lot more to regret. Um, last month, a podcast came out. My wife is a voracious podcast consumer, and so she's constantly sending me stuff. And I've come to realize that um, it's maybe a love language, podcasting is that a love language, or recommendations. And so I, she's good at it. So I've decided I start listening to the ones that she really pushes on me. Last, last month, she pushed on me an episode of a podcast called Slight Change of Plans. Do you know this podcast? It was, number, was one of the number one rated podcasts for a little while on, I think, Spotify, possibly one of the other providers. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a doctor named Maya Shankar, and she interviews various people about the human condition. And for this, uh, this, for this um, program, she was interviewing a guy named Daniel Pink. Now, Daniel Pink is kind of... Uh, he writes books about psychology and leadership and business. He's kind of, a, kind of a public intellectual, pop psychology type guy. Interesting person. You'd see his byline in places like the Atlantic Monthly. And he wrote a book called The, Pow Sorry, the Power of Regret. The Power of Regret. And so Maya Shankar wanted to have him on to talk about regret. You see, because to, do, to make this book and to make it sort of, to root it, he decided to undertake the largest survey of personal regret ever undertaken. And he got 22,000 Americans to answer a questionnaire about regret. Not a long questionnaire, but a questionnaire about regret. And now, the first question was simply, do you have any real regrets about your life? Now, regret is not that you wish uh, something had gone differently. It's that you wish you had done something differently. It usually relates to stuff where we have agency. Regret is something that is, that is, is not something necessarily that's happened to you, but it's more like, oh, I wish I'd studied that instead of this. So what he found was that 82% of these 22,000 people answered yes. I have real regrets about my life. 17% of people answered no, and then went on to list all of the decisions they wish they'd made differently in their lives. <laughs> if you're doing the math, there's 1% left. Those are the trolls. Those are the psychotic people. And they, <laughs> you always have to allow for them. Um, now, what did he find out about regret? He found out a lot of things. He decided to recategorize regrets, and he talked about uh, the most common type of regret is a connection regret. People regret most commonly things like, I didn't spend enough time with my grandmother while she was alive. Uh, there's things called foundational regrets, like I wish I'd saved more money when I was younger. I wish I'd eaten differently in my 20s, or something like that. But then there's more serious things. There's boldness regrets. I wish I had asked that person out, or I wish I hadn't broken up with so-and-so, or I wish I'd quit that job five years ago. I wish I'd gone to grad school. These are the boldness regrets. And then there are moral regrets. Moral regrets usually have to do with, you know, things that you feel acutely that you've done that are wrong. One of the ones that comes up in his research is bullying. People who regret bullying, it turns out, these hang on the longest. So if uh, he gives the example of, of himself, actually, and he says as a, a man in his late 50s, he still thinks about observing bullying on the playground when he was a kid and not doing anything about it. And he still thinks about that. Now, I'll, I'll do him one better, okay? I 
bullied my younger brother. Like, you know, by the way, in America, at my kids' schools right now, the two worst things you can do is one, smoke cigarettes. <sighs> Daddy, he's got a cigarette. Um, or two, be a bully. And it's, it's not good. Bullying, I don't want to bless it in any way, uh, which is to say that I was a bully. I didn't bully other people. I bullied my younger brother. And I bullied him terribly. We moved to England, sorry, to Germany, where my father was getting a PhD in Reformation theology. Um, <laughs> and I was not happy about it. It was seventh grade. You know, that's not a time you want to be uprooted. I was just, you know, things were happening socially, you know. You don't want to go at that point in time. And um, also, I was really into sports. And all of a sudden, I was in a German-speaking school. So I took it out on my younger brother. I was terrible to him. And uh, I really regret it. And uh, he decided it was so scarring that he wrote his college essay about it. Okay? And he got into Harvard. <laughs> so it was a really good essay about how awful I was to him. Now, that's neither here nor there. That's just getting you used to the sound of my voice. Um, Maya Shankar asks Daniel Pink midway through this interview. She says, uh, Daniel, you've spent three years completely marinating in the regrets of the United States. And these are not just minor things. They're heart-wrenching things that people regret about their lives. And she said, are you okay? How are you doing? Are you depressed? Are you discouraged? What is your, are you, are you, do you, do you regret talking about this or thinking about it so long. And he said, you know, that, that I, I was worried about that too. My wife was worried about it, but the funniest thing has happened. I've never felt more connected to and compassion for my fellow humans than I have these past three years. Not only that, I feel less alone than I ever have. So this area of life called regret, which is, which is, I think, the most frequent negative emotion that we express. I don't know how they measure that, but that's what he said, so it must be true. The, um, it, we run away from negative emotions. We do everything we can not to feel them. And he is saying that, in fact, sitting in that day and night did not have the effect of depression or loneliness, or sadness. In fact, he felt a deeper kinship. Now, we're living in a time, as we know, of enormous division, where we're told, at least, that we have very little in common with, with these types of people or those types of people in our country. No one can talk to each other, and increasingly, there, there are outlets that those people listen to, and there are outlets that these people listen to. And you know, the church is divided like that, and everyone is divided like that, and yet here we have Daniel Pink, Founding, finding a bridge to his fellow humans and one that is universal. And I thought, wow, that is a, a very powerful thing uh, to listen to on a podcast. I need to listen to some happy music now. Um, but I thought about that as it relates to anthropology. But I want to, before I get into the term itself, I want to say one more thing, because there's a, there's another, there's a cartoon that I mentioned in the beginning of this book, and it's a, it's a sort of an emblematic cartoon for, for me, and maybe it'll resonate with you. It's a, it's a crowded city street, and everyone's going in different directions. It's men and women and old and young, and it's people of different backgrounds and ethnicities, and they're all, no one's talking to each other, but they all have thought bubbles going out of their heads, and they're going to a common thought bubble. They're all thinking the exact same thing. Now, what do you think they might be thinking? What they're thinking is the following. All these people really seem to have it together, and I still have no idea what's going on. They are not united in their direction, they are not united in their virtues, but they are united in their loneliness and confusion and imposter syndrome. This is a contemporary phrase that has gotten a lot of traction recently. I heard Drew Barrymore talking about it on The View the other day. Imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome? It is the sense that I uh, am an imposter, and that if people really knew what I was like, they wouldn't accept me. 
I, I work with college students at the University of Virginia, and the amount of times I hear, oh, I, I've, and I talk about it at the beginning of the book, uh, uh, people, a, a young woman who called me in a panic one day, she was taking some pre-med classes, she says, I don't belong, everyone else, it comes so easily to them. If they knew how much I was struggling, they would, they would never have let me in. And I wanted to tell her, you know, like, I've, I, I hear that, that's real, that's terrible, it's, it stinks, but guess what? I bet you almost everyone in the class feels the same way. And that's simply the gift of 20 years of ministry. You find out that no one is as happy or put together as they appear to be. And that doesn't make you like them less. It makes you love them more. So, here we've just brought into two unifying truths about human nature. And they're both things that are not flattering. One is that everyone makes bad decisions. And one is that everyone feels like they're making it up and they're fraudulent. And yet this experience creates empathy, compassion, and in fact unity amidst the fractions of today. Now what does this have to do with anthropology? Well, I'm using the word anthropology in the title of this book, not in the way that a cultural anthropologist would use it, uh, sort of studying tribes in, you know, uh, the Australian outback, I'm uh, using it the way that theologians and philosophers use anthropology, which is simply your operating view of human nature. What are human beings good at? What are they not good at? What principles govern our behavior? What do you mean when you say the phrase that Tom Brady said the other day? I'm only human. Really, Tom? <laughs> That's nice to hear. Um, I shouldn't laugh, but you know how it feels. Um, so your anthropology is simply what uh, you, you believe about human nature. And whether we realize it or not, our personal anthropology funds, it creates expectations in our relationships, our jobs, our marriages, our politics, and yes, very much in our spiritual and religious lives. It's bearing on our worldview, and therefore our sort of well-being cannot be overstated. Some anthropologies lead to serious disappointment, anger, cynicism. Other anthropologies can be energizing and life-giving. What they can't be is non-existent. Everyone has an anthropology. It may be cobbled together. It may be half conscious, half non-conscious. It may be completely contradictory. You might be a, a, a cynical so-and-so who's still terribly surprised when the person next to you tries to cut you off in traffic. How dare they? Or you could be the, the happiest person in the world and think that people are amazing and yet you have to assign nefarious motives to that guy down the street who seems to vote a different way. Now, I, uh, th the contention of this book is that seeing people as they truly are as opposed to how we would have them be is a crucial ingredient in generating uh, authentic compassion and lasting love. An accurate anthropology opens us up to all sorts of unexpected vistas of hope and durable hope, not flimsy hope. I chart uh, anthropologies on a continuum of high to low. On the high end, uh, you have sort of optimistic views of human nature, grandiose visions of our, of, of our enterprise, the sunny uh, conceptions of what men and women are like. The higher you get, the more optimistic the assumptions. Now, um, on the low end, you have the more sobering views of human nature. You have understandings of humanity as, as being limited and uh, in need of help, both from other people and ultimately from God. Though a low anthropology doesn't necessarily uh, entail belief in God. But you, that's where you find understandings of human beings as finite and biased, and in many cases quite weak. Now ground zero for the proliferation of anthropologies is what? Graduation speeches. <laughs> Graduation speeches. You always contain a vision of what the good life looks like 
what people are capable of and how they should go about uh, realizing that vision. Uh, Steve Jobs drew on the high end of the equation in 2005 when he told Stanford graduates to have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow know what you truly want to become. Sounds nice, especially if it's Steve Jobs saying it, I guess. It, I mean, it, seriously, he's, he's, it might, maybe it was inspiring. I gave this version of this talk out in, out in California a few weeks ago, and there was a woman there who actually was at that speech. And she said, well, let me tell you, Dave, none of us were listening. It was 105 degrees, and we were dying to get to the reception. Low anthropology, my friends. <coughs> we are ruled by our appetites and our discomforts. Um, so that's, think about that, feel that. Inspiring, right? On the other end of the, of the, of the case, you have this, one of the great patron saints of American low anthropology, Anne Lamott. She is a writer and a personality and a, a Christian sort of hippie mystic in Marin County. And she uh, once told a boot group of graduates the following. She said, everyone is screwed up, broken, clingy, and scared, even the people who seem to have it more or less together. They are much more like you than you would believe, so try not to compare your insides to their outsides. Nice. Again, a high anthropology views people as defined by their best days and greatest achievements, their dreams and aspirations. Now, while a low anthropology does not ignore those possibilities, it assumes a much more reliable through line in human experience of heartache, self-doubt, and, you know, weakness. It assumes that the bulk of our mental energy is focused on subjects that would be embarrassing or even shameful if broadcast, and that our ability to do the right thing in any given situation is hampered by all sorts of unseen factors. Now again, if my 10-year-old came back from school and told me, guess what I learned in fourth grade today, Daddy? I learned that I'm screwed up, broken, clingy, and scared. I'd say, son, no, you're not. You're my special little guy. Now let's go have some ice cream. Maybe you had a bad day. Um, I'm not sure I want to hear that. I want him to say I've got a good intuition and that I want to follow my dreams and I can, I can, if I put my mind to it, hard work, yada, yada, yada. You understand me. But imagine you're not talking to a 10-year-old. Imagine you yourself are the recipient of those two speeches. Maybe you think Anne Lamott's speech is a little harsh at first. I mean, sure, I may be scared and clingy, but what about, you know, Tamara from high school? She had it going on. What about Miles Rainier, who didn't seem to have any problems in the self-confidence department? He didn't seem clingy. If, and, and again, if my kid came home, I'd say, I'd say don't be so hard on yourself. Maybe it, I'd, 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 I'd try to, to, to get some self-care going for my, own, for my own self in that kind of moment. However, say you had a tough week, and say you spoke insensitively to a loved one or fumbled the ball at school. Well, Lamont's description all of a sudden might strike you as more accurate. You might feel recognized by her words and frankly a little burdened by Steve Jobs' exhortation. After all, you're no longer 22, you're 43, and you don't always like where your intuition has taken you. And you look at your siblings who wrote essays about you that got them into Harvard and you think, where did my good intuition go? Steve? I didn't have what it took to enslave the entire human race. Um, He's such a lovable, he's such an easy punching bag at this point. We all thought he was so great. Um, anyway, uh, Anne Lamott's admission conveys compassion. You can feel your shoulders unknot, right? Steve Jobs' advice, not so much. His words convey pressure. And this is the great irony of a low anthropology. What sounds insulting or bracing is actually liberating. And what sounds liberating at first is actually oppressive and embittering. 
This is why when I spoke last night in downtown Minneapolis, and they, these, there's a church there that just decided they really like this book, and they said, we're going we're gonna to promote it, but only if you let us use our title for the book, which is How to Not Hate People. <laughs> I thought, that's a pretty good book. Like, I think, I, I don't know, I, I'm not into the how-tos, but um, I'll take it. Um, now, what exactly does a low anthropology consist of? Because it's, as, as much as it sounds like I'm trying to translate simply sin, it, it, it includes that, but it, that's not the entire, that's not the whole loaf of low anthropology. Now, there are three pillars of low anthropology. The first one is what I would simply call limitation, which is a way of talking what, about what Christians mean when they say creatureliness or finitude. The idea is that there is a God, and I'm not He. I am limited in what I can do and what I can be. I cannot be in two places at once, no matter what my children's soccer coaches seem to think. I have to get sleep every once in a while. I need to eat. I'm limited not only, though, by biology and by time, I'm limited by my context. I'm a person living in history, and I might think that we're at the apex of all knowledge and wisdom, but that's what my parents thought in 1985, you know? So uh, we are limited, and we are limited not only in what we can do, but in what we can know. So which means, again, there is a God, and you're not He, which is to say, you, can, you, you do not have access to the full truth about anything. You can study, you can work hard, you can know 99.9% .9 of what there is to know, but you simply cannot know everything. Which hopefully means that you can keep listening. You can, what does Ted Lasso say? You can be curious. There's always one more drawer to open before you can make a full and final judgment of other people or yourself. It's good news to be a limited person. I quote in the book Ada Calhoun, who wrote a book called Why We Can't Sleep, where she went and polled all of these women in their 40s, these college-educated affluent women who, who were dealing with what is now known as the insomnia epidemic in America, that no one can sleep. And what she found was there was an unspoken imperative to that these women, as opposed to their mothers had to excel not only in domestic life, but also in professional life. That the possibility of doing it all became a mandate to do it all. And so that these, uh, she felt her peers were suffering under the burden of an impossible expectation that they must have it all. It's not just enough to have a nice house or a good career or a beautiful family, now you have to have all of those things and you also better be recycling and you also <laughs> better be showing the world how much you care about your recycling. You know, it's, 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 it's so much demand. There is no sense of human limitation baked into that equation. But the same thing is true with the chief um, emotional conditions that I wrote this book under, the two, one of which is alluded to in this title of the talk tonight, but one of which is burnout. Now, burnout is a phrase that came into being popularly when Anne Helen Peterson wrote about it for BuzzFeed in relation to millennials. The people that were feeling most burned out were 25-year-olds who were working three jobs in Brooklyn and not making enough money to pay back their loans and they were having a sense of, of errand paralysis and feeling a malaise about life and that, that, why, that they'd been sold a false bill of goods. But once she posted this article and all the older folks say, hey, how can you be 25 and burned out? You know? and, and, and what you had was, in fact, you had middle schoolers say, wait a second, we feel kind of burned out. And then you had healthcare professionals say, hold the phone, we couldn't be more burned out. And then you had mothers of young children saying, are you kidding? We are the most burned out. And it became a burned out-a-thon, right? Because what happened is it turned out everyone is burned out. We're all living under the weight of an impossible demand, the sense that life demands more of us than we can possibly imagine, and the treadmill just keeps getting faster. 
So a low anthropology says, in fact, there are very firm limits on what you're able to accomplish. <clears throat> and no, which addresses, I think, the warring certainties that we are all choking on. Um, secondly, in a low anthropology is the, what I call the conception of doubleness, which is, a tr which is my attempt to translate the Lutheran idea of the bondage of the will. So that not only are we creatures, but we are creatures whose agency is compromised. I can choose which socks to wear, I can choose which parking space, but I cannot really choose to love a person that I can't, that is unlovable. I cannot choose to not be angry when someone says, you've got to stop being angry. I cannot choose uh, to be calm. I cannot choose not to worry. I cannot choose the most important things in life. I, my, my, I am doubled. I am, I, what's going on inside me is much more like the movie Inside Out than it is like a sort of a flow chart. We are a, a, a group of competing motivations, and we are very emotional at our core. Philip Melanchthon <laughs> said the following, internal affections are not in our power, for by experience and practice we have found that the will of its own accord cannot assume love, hate, or the like affections. So, <clears throat> A high anthropology says that you are a rational creature making healthy decisions and you just need more information to make a better choice. A low anthropology says actually you are tied in all sorts of knots by your upbringing and by your own DNA and by your, the fact of sin. And so me telling you what to do may even make you do the opposite of what I just told you. Doubleness actually accounts for life as it's lived, which is as people addicted to dopamine hits they get through social media or to shopping or to alcohol. The experience of addiction is one of doubleness, of Romans 7, of knowing what it is to do but not necessarily having the power to always do it. So that's the second pillar. The third pillar is sin. I would call it self-centeredness in the book. But if, if, if I, I want to recognize in this book that the word sin is a dirty word for a lot of people. It's been used in sinful ways to create the opposite of what I think the word is meant to capture. So I think you could simply, it's enough to acknowledge that there is an ineluctable dark side to human nature. And if you don't understand that, you'll be very confused by human history, or especially your own. That there is such a thing as three boys in the back of the car trying to inflict pain on one another, just to see what it's like, okay? Um, parents know all about this third pillar and again, you think that this sounds negative, and the world runs away from it because we always run away from negative feelings. But what we find is the same thing we find when it comes to regret and confusion and imposter syndrome. That, the, uh, that, that actually traveling on the rails of a low anthropology is not shame, but love. You go to any wedding in America, and the toasts you will hear from the bridesmaids and the groomsmen will not be about how great the bride and the groom are. There might be an inkling of that, but most of the toasts will be about what the bride-to-be is like in her sweatpants on a Tuesday night, having ordered food for the last three days and watching, stayed up watching reality TV shows. That's where you actually know a person not at their best, but at their actual mundane or sometimes their most shameful. Then the guys will get up there and they'll just roast the guy. And they'll say, he's terrible. Like, he's gotten pulled over, he's gotten a DUI. Like, he, he's, I can't believe you're marrying this guy. And yet I know he would come, he'd be the first person to visit me in jail. You know, that's the sort of thing you hear. 
That's love. That is love. That's not necessarily admiration, but it's love. Because love is only conveyed through weakness. So, um, we are living in a time that is marked by deep division and acrimony. Uh, we've talked, I don't need to tell you any more about that. We know that our social fabric is fraying with the worst kind of tribalism, that you cannot turn on the TV or peruse a news website without breathing in some of the fumes. Much of this despair, I'm convinced, is fueled by a superficial, not an untrue, but a superficial view of human nature, a high anthropology. It's a near default view that's highly marketable because it promises us control, because it flatters us with fantasies about our capacities and our motivations, but in actual emotional reality fails to account for the actual data of our lives and therefore leaves us lonelier and more burned out as a result. I hear from so many people who feel burdened by the pressure to perform an ideal version of themselves all the time. The other great emotional condition that I tried to inform the writing of this book is loneliness. And since, you know, it, those levels have just been skyrocketing. I don't know if I quoted it this morning or where, but uh, there was a, a great new book called Of Boys and Men that came out a few weeks ago. And did you know that the number of men in America who report that they have no close friends has quintupled in the last 10 years? Quintupled. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> You could do better than that, but still, it's, it's sad. People are lonely, and they're lonely because they're never seen for who they actually are. There's an intolerance, something about the system, and you could call it social media, you could call it simply, you know, toxic conceptions of who we're supposed to be, but some, there's some inallowance for the full picture when it comes to people, and if people can't actually ever be seen, they will never feel loved. They will feel only progressively more alone. This is the thing. By editing out the less savory stuff about our humanity, we also snuff out solidarity, empathy, vulnerability. We snuff out love and humor, too. All of a sudden, we think we're the only one with problems, the only one barely hanging on, the only one who doesn't belong. But thank God the truth about who we are is far more comprehensive so low anthropology is my attempt to cut through all this noise with hope, highlighting this counterintuitive truth that weakness and limitation can function as a doorway to compassion, unity, grace, and yes, faith. All those things that the reformers enshrined, the, the great truths of sola fide and sola gratia, I'm convinced that if you want to see an increase in hope, in understanding, in unity, amidst the engulfing mercilessness of today, especially if you want to communicate anything approaching grace, you must begin with a low anthropology. Not coincidentally, I found that religion in general and Christianity in particular make very little sense in the context of a high anthropology. After all, it was Jesus himself who said it's the sick that need a doctor, not the well. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. That's where the action is happening. You see, this is the other great truth about a low anthropology. It is an invitation not only to collaboration and friendship and help from other people, but help and rescue from God. A low anthropology goes hand in glove with a high Christology. And if the reformers were good at anything, they were good at that. Thank you for listening. I know we, I know we need to have time for some questions, right? I could keep going all night. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, David, for your presentation and for sharing. And now is a great chance for us to ask you some questions. Um, and so I'll pass some microphones around. If you would like to have a question, we'll take, oh, we'll take 
a little bit of time here, and then there will be a book reception afterwards and another time to share informally, but who would like to ask our first question? Go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Um, in the book, you talk about um, how our culture is focused on acknowledging what's wrong in the world, uh, rooting out a toxicity, privilege, promoting inclusion, forcing people to apologize, but there's no forgiveness amidst that, mm. um, no acknowledgement that what's wrong in the world will never, will never truly be fixed, at least in our lifetimes for now. How do we make that jump to external forgiveness? Um, from acknowledging the injustice to forgiving people amidst that injustice? <sighs> or just talk around that. <laughs> um, that's a great question. What you've asked is uh, once we acknowledge how uh, broken things are, uh, yet we, and we're actually, in many ways, we're kind of good at describing that, making television shows about how dysfunctional things are, about systemic things, and uh, but we seem to have foreclosed the possibility of redemption. Is that what I'm, I'm hearing? And uh, I advocate for external forgiveness, which is because I know that you know every person I know who's committed a terrible crime says they that other people have forgiven them, but they can't forgive themselves. And uh, that's why, uh, if there's hope there, it's not can't be in self forgiveness. It's got to be in forgiveness from God. So or maybe the perpetrator or the, the victim. <clears throat> How do we make that jump? I think that's a Holy Spirit thing, to be honest with you. I think people, um, the thing about the kind of mercilessness of a, um, a high anthropology that says um, the problem with the world is those other people, it is, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a whirlpool. You know, it sucks everyone in. I mean, it, no, one's, no one gets out alive from that. Uh, purity spirals is what they're called a lot of times, where every, we're trying to police each other to have the most pure motivations about X, Y, or Z. And um, I want to say two things. If you're dealing with that in your own life or other people, know that the a thing like a purity spiral is usually a cry for love. Um, because what is going on in most, the way that sort of I think politics, for example, has been um, uh, divinized is that people have found community and belonging in uh, that they haven't found elsewhere. They find it in common cause around issues in many ways of real importance. But what happens is once an ideology becomes a, 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 a vehicle for belonging, the people that belong the most are the ones that are loudest. And in order to, be, or the people that belong the most are the ones that are pointing out the ones that belong the least. And that is a self-defeating thing. In the church, we call it, you, you have a church of one very quickly. And uh, the Protestant Reformation knows all about that. Uh, so, but at the base, in terms of forgiving the people that maybe we don't like or something like that, know that they're in, crying out for love in the same way that you are in certain ways. Um, but forgiveness when it comes to that, I always feel forgiveness is miraculous. And so there's no prescription for it, except for to remember that you've been forgiven. The only way that we ever forgive anyone is through prior forgiveness. Um, and that's why the gospel, that's why Lutherans believe that you preach the law and the gospel every week, is to get people back in touch with the, the, their own forgiveness because it's so counterintuitive to the human spirit that we forget it. So I don't have a prescription, but I do know that it's a lot better to uh, acknowledge that we're all in need of forgiveness than pretend that only some people are. Thank you. How does one overcome the natural high anthropological presuppositions that we often have on a day-to-day -day basis hmm. that kind of make up our natural framework? How does one 
overcome the default high anthropology that seems to be just like mother's milk um, that we all bring into life. Well, I think um, death is a, has a good way of doing that. And I think this is why Lutherans always talk about the old Adam needing to be killed. But um, that sometimes gets a little abstract. You just think about your own physical impending demise. Um, and there, there, no amount of bootstrapping is going to change that. So, and a, so a culture that ignores death or runs away from it or makes aging itself into a sin is going to be one in which uh, high, it's going to be high anthropology because it's going to act like we can even control something like our mortality. And so um, I think you want to hang out at hospices and funeral parlors and watch shows where everyone gets killed. I'm just joking about the last part. Don't watch shows that everyone is killed, but I, I think that uh, high anthropology, you know what's, um, I was talking to some people today, you know, have you ever heard the saying, like, um, fire and knives teach their own lessons? You know what that, like, meaning if you, you want to teach a kid about fire and knives, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> Just let them touch the fire or the knife, and it will teach its own lesson. High anthropology teaches its own lesson. Um, it will make you a very lonely person who everyone can't stand to be around. And uh, you'll look around one day and realize, why does everyone hate me? It's because I'm the most judgmental person in the room. Or I hate myself because I think I'm the only one who's suffering. Um, there's some sort of self-righteousness at work. I don't know. High anthropology... Uh, teaches its own lessons. Other questions? All right. I'm testing an impression that the practice of confession and absolution is a practice of low anthropology in particular in the individual form. I'd be curious about your response. I was gifted about the age of 20 when the pastor who was leading the weekend said, um, tomorrow's communion, so tonight I'll be in my office for this thing most of you have never heard of, but you're invited to come in and make your confession and I'll speak forgiveness. And I heeded the invitation and have been grateful ever since. Uh, in confession and absolution, in particular in that individual form, as a practice of low anthropology? Yes, no, maybe? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that perceptive comment about uh, confession and absolution being a practice of low anthropology. I, I'd say absolutely. I'm, um, I'm on board with confession and absolution. I think it implies a circular view of a life that is true to the death and resurrection paradigm that is not uh, we, we, high anthropology assumes a sort of a linear progression in life that um, I'm always getting, it's a growth paradigm. Everything is, I've got to always be getting better at everything. And the trajectory of my life has to be like this. And that's easy to believe until you're about 45 and your knees give out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or, you, you know, you're, you, the first divorce. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but like, you, it is... Um, Life isn't, isn't, isn't an upward trajectory. It's actually, and, and, but what's good news is that the trajectory of the Christian gospel is downward. I think it's, um, you know, Jacob, Jesus going down Jacob's ladder, uh, just God descending into the, you know, to our world. So confession and absolution, yes. I think confession and absolution is the great model of the most transformative uh, um, communities that you'll ever experience. That would be, um, Yes, the personal one-on-one. -on -one. I think any time you've had a great small group Bible study, something like that, people experience what they're really experiencing is a kind of a being seen in their fullness and confession, and uh, not being people not turning away, which is a, which is a form of sort of a proxy absolution. Um, and this is another thing people get. Uh, I think that I have to always clarify about low anthropology. People think it sounds like a defeatist view of human um, goodness, when in fact the most transformative and other-centered communities on the face of the planet are ones which begin with a low anthropology. 
High anthropology communities turn into cesspools of competition and cutthroat uh, uh, judgment. And uh, communities of low anthropology, I'm thinking of AA, um, you have a group of people who were dead and are now alive. I mean, you, 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 the, the churches that you see in you know, Mother Teresa's work, th these, are, these are people who do not think highly of themselves because they're not even thinking of themselves that much at all. And that's a beautiful thing. And I believe that that is rooted in the practice of confession and absolution. It's not always called that, but I think at its best it is, but I think it, it's forms the, of, of that. Uh, and that's what people receive in some of these other replacement religions for a little while <laughs> until they, they have a way of turning on you. I saw one over there. Yeah. Isn't the practice of striving for perfection, like the Lord says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, it's not a perfectionism. It is that when we are made into Christ, there is something about being sanctified that draws out the best of us. And it's not in looking at ourselves. Mm. It's in that when we are made perfect as Christ is calling us, there is a, a, a deification, a sanctification that we participate in Christ being made and known, made known and loved in the world. So is low anthropology, I mean, it's an acceptance of my weakness and God's strength. Well, at the same time, it can't be at the cost of continuing to strive for that excellence because that is what virtue is. Like that's what God is asking us for in the gospels as well. So how do those things connect to one another? How does the striving for virtue connect with a low anthropology? Well, I think um, the virtue that Jesus is after is usually virtue for its own sake. It's not in order to get you better points. And how does that actually happen? How do people actually act, how do unvirtuous people actually act virtuously? It usually involves some form of forgiveness and grace. I think in practice, the, 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 the um, the people that are most other-centered are the ones who've been sort of freed from themselves. You're not freed from yourself until you're um, a little bit dead. <laughs> um, I'll say this, though, about that. I think this view, a low anthropology, and by that I mean an Augustinian anthropology, or a Lutheran anthropology, or a Pauline anthropology, or simply a Christian anthropology, has a, has a more hopeful view of sanctification than a high anthropology does because it puts the onus on God to do the sanctifying. And I would put my money on God to do the sanctifying any day of the week over my own capabilities. So it, is, it actually holds out tremendous hope for um, real transformation rather than in my paltry attempts to partner with God in a meaningful way, which are usually imbued with all sorts of mixed motives. So. I want to say that uh, a low anthropology holds, a Lutheran would say, holds God to his promises and um, allows God to be God, or at least in theory, because part of having a low anthropology is the understanding that you're not going to hold it consistently. Um, therefore, confession, absolution, confession, absolution. I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm negating striving for virtue. I just always want to get back to how does that actually happen in a person's life? Where do we see people striving for virtue in a way that's not self-aggrandizing? It strikes me that there's a bit of irony in speaking about low anthropology at an institution of higher education. <laughs> yes. Unpack how you think a low anthropology could help those of us involved in higher education <clears throat> think newly about how to go about that work. That's a great question. The question is how do we proceed from a low anthropology into higher education? The, the, one of the fa my favorite sections in the book is about the scientific method. Uh, to which we owe so much of our progress as Westerners. You know, you could say even Steve Jobs owes some uh, progress to that. 
And the scientific method was pioneered by Sir Francis Bacon. For Sir Francis Bacon had a rock bottom anthropology. He believed that human will was fallen and that reason, we were so subject to deception that you needed as many people as possible doing the exact same experiments before you could verify any kind of truth. And it was laborious, and it was slow going, and it was kind of awful because it set scientists against each other to try to disprove one another. And yet the net result has been an accumulation of knowledge and wisdom about the way that God's world works, the likes of which the world has never seen. So a low anthropology does not negate the search for knowledge and mastery. It does negate the conclusive search for the conclusive search for mastery. But if you uh, most academics I know, and I happen to know a lot because that stupid little brother of mine, he, he they're actually not after definitive mastery. They enjoy their subject matter and they are wanting to know more always. And they're constantly going into different curiosity is what's guiding them rather than control. And so um, I don't think it negates a, a search for um, deeper knowledge of God's world in any r respect. Again, it's one of these great ironies that it enhances our ability. If, you're, if you have a little suspicion of people's ability to mastery, you're going to lead to a, a much more glorious um, accumulation of, of, of wisdom. All right, we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. So in your presentation, you were talking about um, this idea of, uh, I think, I believe it was like the stigma of using the word sin. Could yes. you expand on that a little bit? Sure. I mean, this is maybe not your experience here, um, but it's the experience of a lot of people that sin is understood as a euphemism for shame. It's not. It's meant to name the experience of shameful behavior, but it's not a source of shame. But sin in our current context is usually understood as sinful. Meaning what people hear when they hear you're a sinner is what they hear oftentimes is it's okay for me to judge you for being uh, imperfect. And that is... Um, that's the opposite of what sin is supposed to lead to repentance. And it's a way to name our need and how short we fall and our rebellion from God and all of these things. It's not meant to be a bludgeon. And sin, I think, uh, there's a certain strand of American piety, call it fundamentalism, call it, you know, you know 20th century evangelicalism. I don't know what you want to call it, but that had what sounded like a low anthropology, but was actually a high anthropology. What I mean is that the message that the kids would hear growing up, and my grandfather, uh, my great-grandfather was a Lutheran pastor, and his, he, his, he my grandfather, um, heard this very clearly from a, from a Lutheran, you know, the pietistic upbringing in California, and he walked away from the church and never came back. Um, what he heard was, you're a sinner, a wretched sinner, now stop. Stop it. Stop being that. Stop being a sinner. Quit it. I can't believe you're still a sinner. So it's effectively yelling at people and pitting them against themselves rather than it's not a low enough anthropology. A low anthropology would say that, yes, you are a sinner. That's not the only thing that's true about you, but it's one of the things that's true about you. And, uh, but part of what it means to be a sinner is that you cannot redeem yourself. You need a redeemer, a mediator, a savior. And so what you have is a generation of people that were pitted in against themselves in a battle that they could never win. And so they felt lied to and baited and switched, and they ran as far away as they possibly could. I don't blame them. Yeah, um, I've got two questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, the first one is: uh, Do you um, do you think, 
Or can we say that both law and high anthropology are reflected in Luther's writings? Like uh, law anthropology in the sense of our relationship with God and how we live out our faith in our community. And high anthropology in the sense of Luther trying to set um, high value for um, the German community, so to say. Um, my, my second question is, like, where do you see both law and high anthropology uh, reflected in the life and ministry of the church today? Um, was Luther, did he, he understood the life of, he, low anthropology and the life of a believer, but as you, you said, uh, as it relates to the German people, he had a higher anthropology. So it's sort of a, he had a nationalistic strain there. Um, I don't know enough to say that confidently about Luther. I think that he certainly seemed to wrestle with the fact that Christians uh, needed to be forgiven just as much as non-Christians. So I think in that sense he had a very low anthropology. Um, I think sometimes the danger of something like a, 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 the two kingdoms doctrine can slip into a sort of a high anthropology over here, low anthropology over here, and that can be dissonant. That can be difficult for people to reconcile. I don't think that's what he was trying to do there, but I think that that's, in practice, that's sometimes how it's played out. Um, the second question was, where do, I see it in, where do I see these tensions in the life of the church today? I think primarily uh, the American church is uh, just is, is the same as the American culture in that we, it's completely inured and drowning in low anthropology. That pastors are just as burnt out as anyone. You know, you read these th people in the church want to run for the hills because they're being asked to be superhuman and they're being told that... Um, the higher up you get in the hierarchy, the less grace there is for you. Uh, it's a, it's a truly toxic. That that word I don't really like, but it, it's it's a truly toxic situation, that breeds refugees and, um, yeah, and uh, atheism, uh, as far as I can see. I see low anthropology at work in uh, when when people are converted, and in jails. In prisons where prison ministries are flourishing and people need to hear about the forgiveness of sins and second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and I don't think well that'll ever lose its allure or that the figure and person of Jesus will ever be less interesting um, and I see that working out in Pentecostal places I see that working out in um, non-denominational places. I see it in certain Roman Catholic. I mean, I try to say that, like, the problem of high anthropology is not related to one denomination. You see it in every denomination, but you also see glimpses of low anthropology in almost every denomination that I've come into contact with. So I see great hope. Uh, whenever the church experiences a revival, it's usually because it's, it's gotten, it's reclaimed its heritage of low anthropology, high Christology, the forgiveness of sins, the absolution of the sinner, that is good news for people sunk down in the experience of themselves and other people. So I see it all the time. I see it in recovery groups and, um, you know, uh, Cali Yee, right there. Uh, so it's, it's all over the place. It just is, it hides a little bit more than the high anthropology does. Well, we'll all have a chance to talk and visit more with um, David Zoll in the, in the, I was going to say the narthex. It's not the narthex, but the gathering space right out here. Um, he has several books that you can um, purchase as well. He will do a book signing. Um, he'll be out there. There is also, I believe, tea and coffee and apple cider. Thank you, Christy, for ordering lots of extra apple cider. So, um, and also, I think some um, other desserts and such too. All right. Let's thank our speaker once more. Thank you all for coming out. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you right outside.